I know that some of you are going to biohack yourself to death. And I think that's a good thing. It's not good that you're going to do that, but if we know that, we can do something about it. And so I want to spend the next few minutes talking about why I believe that's the case, um, who of you that is going to affect, and what we can do about it. So I, I really love the industry, right? And the, the, talk, um, the topic of the talk today is the state of personalized wellness. And you might call it personalized wellness, you might call it biohacking, you might call it longevity interventions. In essence, it's about trying to find the tools, trying to find the strategies to extend your healthy lifespan, to extend your lifespan, and to optimize your health. And I'm traveling to quite a few of these conferences on a regular basis, and I talk to the scientists, I talk to the people in the audience, and I'm always blown away, right? It's, you know how people say, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room, because you should be in another room where you can learn from people. Every time I'm at these conferences, not only am I clearly not the smartest person in the room, most of the time I'm feeling like, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, who, who let me in, right? And um, so, really, um, there's a lot of great science going on, research going on, like in the fields of biology, of medicine, of pharmacology, of supplements, of um, informatics, bioinformatics, AI, all trying to look at um, how we can optimize our health and what's are the best strategies to optimize our health. But um, really, it's, it's in a way, it's sometimes trying to find the, the magic bullet or the, the silver bullet or the magic pill, however you want to call it, um, that we just take and then we're going to fix our health. But what most people seem to forget or push away quite often is that we actually have this magic bullet already, right? And I want to ask you a question. Who of you um, has or had cancer, knows someone who had cancer, suffered from cancer, raise your hand and keep them up please for a moment, has lost a relative to cancer, right? It's almost everyone, right? And there recently was a study in The Lancet, which is one of the most prestigious scientific medical journals, and the study looked at what percentage of all cancers could be avoided through lifestyle changes. They call it modifiable risk behaviors. So not because you have, you're genetically screwed up, not because you're living in a toxic environment, simply Avoiding cancer through lifestyle, the changes in your lifestyle. What would you guess? What percentage is it? Is it 2%, 3%, 5%, 10%, 19%, 90%, 25%? It's actually 44%. It's 44%. So that means every single, every second hand that we've been seeing could have been avoided, right? Every second hand, every second tragedy, every second uh, individual that we lost could have been avoided just through lifestyle. And it, sometimes it really blows my way that we're trying to find these, these, these magic pills if we're not even getting the basics right. And so what are the basics? I mean, health is pretty simple in essence. Health is like 20-80. 20% is your genetics. You can't change that. But 80% we can change. So whether your genetics, the good ones and the bad ones, whether your genes will express themselves, you have an influence over, right? You can, you can decide whether that's going to happen or not through the lifestyle. And the obvious question is, so what is that? What can I do to, to uh, make sure I'm staying healthy? And the answer is absolutely boring, right? You all know it. It's essentially four things. It's how we eat, it's how we take care of our body, how we exercise, it's how we sleep, and how we take care of our mental health. So it's very basic, right? We all know it. And the rest is an icing on the cake, right? There's a lot of things you can do to optimize, but that's really an icing on the cake. Get those four things right, and you're going to add 10, 15, 20 good and healthy years to your life. And that's what we want, right? Um, well, so the question is, if, if it's so simple, why isn't everyone doing it, right? Why isn't everyone living healthy and, and uh, optimizing their health in that way? Because I believe um, there is two main reasons for that. The reason number one is we are creatures of habit, right? We don't want to change. I have the ways I like to do things, and I don't want to change how I do things. I've only always been doing it like that. And the second part of the answer is, in order to truly optimize your health in a personalized way that's really good for you, because what does eating mean for every one of you? It's different. How you should eat is different for every single person in the room. How you should train is different for every single person in the room. How you should take care of your sleep, your mental health, is different for every single person in the room. In order to do that in a proper way, you need to 
understand three things essentially. You need to understand your genetics because that's the blueprint you're built on. That's how your house of health is going to do, be built in the future. You also need to understand your body, your biomarkers. What's the snapshot of your health? Because that will tell you how the house was built and if there's any issues, if there's maybe a window that's uh, where air is coming in and so on. So you need to understand your biomarkers, that's number two. And number three is you need to understand your patterns of your, your behavior, your intrinsic behavior and your extrinsic behavior. Because only if you understand these patterns of your behavior, they can really make a change happen in your body and with yourself. And so um, what we do is um, I run a little company and it's compared to the amazing stuff that we're seeing on stage here, it's absolutely boring, right? We, we care about health data. We have four, 40 people looking at health data all day long. We have a clinical team looking at health data all day long. And um, we try to find ways to use that data to help people to become healthy and to stay healthy. And instead of boring you with the details of, of the, what we do and the platform that we use, I want to show you a, a practical example of an actual person that we've worked with. Um, of course, we changed the name, we changed the picture, but this is a real case. And this will show you how health can really, uh, how data can really have an impact on health and how using data in a personalized way can make massive changes in people's lives in a short period of time. But I want to start with um, a video that shows how healthcare is done today. And this was secretly recorded a few weeks back in Italy. Um, so please don't share it, um, but I'm going to show you anyway, right? Okay, sound was missing. But anyway, so that, that's uh, me and my middle daughter in Italy um, playing whack-a-mole. But that's exactly how we do healthcare nowadays, right? We wait until we get sick, we wait until the symptom pops up, and then we hit it with a hammer. We hit it with medications, and then we wait until the next symptom pops up, and then we do that again. And we believe there must be a better way than doing that, because that's, that's not a strategy that's sustainable. So um, I want to show you a case um, of a person and um, let's just call him Bob and Bob is like many of you in the room, like he's a 40 something, he has a family, he's a very successful entrepreneur, um, investor, he's a really driven person, driven personality, really high energy. But Bob also has another issue, Bob has something that's called metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is not an acute disease, right? It's more of a cluster of symptoms that you have, fatigue, um, high blood pressure, high blood lipids. So it really is, is this cluster of symptoms and it doesn't get you sick immediately, but what it does is it puts you at a way higher risk of disease later in life. Increases risk for cancer, increases risk for neurodegenerative neurodegenerative diseases, increases um, risk for diabetes, for example. So it's an issue you should be aware of, because actually, if you look around, statistically, one in three of you will develop metabolic syndrome over the course of the life if you don't already have it. So it's something that affects a lot of us. So typically, what's the treat treatment for that? What do people do uh, that have that? They go to a doctor and, of course, medications, right? They're going to put in statins, they're going to put, uh, put on all kinds of medications. And for Bob, it was exactly the case. So he went to his doctor, and his doctor put him on a bunch of medications. And then he was retested, and actually everything got worse. So the doctor's answer was, we need more medications. We need to put you on more medications, right? That's typically what doctors do. And the fun thing about having multiple medications is you, you have this polypharmacy effect, right? So um, you have a lot of side effects that get worse and worse, the more medications you take, all the fun stuff, you know, fever and uh, diarrhea and liver failure and erectile dysfunctions for the gentleman in the room. So all the stuff you want to avoid. And the more medications you take late in your life, um, the more the quality of life will decrease. Like it has toxic effects and we want to avoid taking all these medications over a long period of time. So luckily, Bob knew some of the doctors that we work with, and um, we said, okay, we believe there's a different strategy, right? We believe there's a different way 
of looking at your health. And they talked, and Bob's original doctors, they said, okay, you got two months to try something, and if it doesn't work, then it's more medications. End of line, right? So how can we do this? How can we look at healthcare differently? Um, typically, this is how your doctor will see you, right? It's a lot of labs, little abbreviation, no one really understands. So you're really not involved in your treatment because most people will not understand what any of that means. Well, GGT, liver value, what, what, what does this really mean, right? So you're not involved in your own treatment. And so one thing we can do and one thing we do is just how can we show data differently, right? How can we visualize the data differently to make you more involved, right? We can use colors, we can use ranges, so people will see, ah, oh, okay, triglycerides, I'm three times over, CRP, inflammation, 10 times over what it should be. So Bob had chronic inflammation going on there. Um, GGT, liver value, twice as high, uh, blood lipids, a mass blood pressure, one or two years away probably from a heart attack. So that's the first thing we can do with data, right? It's visualizing, it's not, not really rocket science. What else can we do? We can not only use snapshots of data, but we can show data over time. We can show how Bob's health has changed over time. And what we could see in that case was it didn't really change much. It was bad and it stayed bad and it actually got worse. So what else can we look at? We can look at medications, right? And we can look, and that's where typically doctors would stop, we can look at genetics because every one of you is unique. Every one of you has your unique, genetic uniqueness. And so typically a genetic um, report will look something like that. You have all this little abbreviation. Again, no one understands that. Um, so what do we do? Right? We use algorithms to put this data into context and to put them in what we call pathways. You have different pathways in your body. You have cellular pathways, inflammation, detox, methylation. Um, you have systemic pathways, your hormonal system. Um, you have cardiovascular pathways and a few others. And you, we can use the genes to identify where you might be at risk, where are the areas you, where you might be at risk. Or why you have, an, we call it a high impact. High impact is like return on investment. So if you do good, things will improve quickly. If you do bad, things will go south rather quickly. Then what else can we do? Um, we can look at activity, right? Everyone is wearing wearable devices nowadays. Even your phone is a wearable device that gives you information about how many steps you take, for example. And what we saw in Bob's case was he was not really moving enough, right? He had, had a very sedentary lifestyle, um, not getting enough steps in, not, not getting enough movement and exercise in. Sleep was okay in his case. We can also track that. A lot of you are wearing your aura ring, I've seen. Um, and the next thing is diet and nutrition. And diet is a really bad thing to track because no one likes food journaling. You do this for two days and then you stop it and then you start lying to yourself and start lying to your doctors. But what everyone has is, is, a, is a phone, right? And everyone is taking pictures anyway for the gram, right? To showcase what you're eating. So we can use the pictures that we have to analyze what's on the plate. It's not perfect, but it gives us a good indication on the macronutrient profile and how people are eating. And in Bob's case, there was way too many sugars, way too many simple carbs, not enough good fats. So how do we bring everything together? So of course, there are some new things like these aging clocks. You might heard about that. It's a big thing in the longevity industry. So how much older your body is compared to your chronological age, for example. So we can make some calculations based on the blood and everything that we have. But really what we do and where we really um, believe we can make a difference is if we combine all these data points. So what we do in our system, we look at everything we collected. We look at the genomics, we look at the biomarkers, the lab tests, we look at the wearable device data that we're getting from people. And then the system will say us, okay, what are the areas we want to have a closer look at? And in Bob's case, that was in two areas, the cellular pathways and in the area of cardiovascular health. And um, there's many different other pathways we can look at. But really, this kind of provides us with almost like a dashboard of your health, right? What are the areas, like, almost like a financial dashboard, but what are the areas that based on the genetics, based on the biomarkers, based on the wearable devices, data that we're collecting, what are the areas we want to have a closer look at? Because that's where the low-hanging fruits are. That's where we can start optimizing. Because that's really data-driven. That will show you exactly if you start working on the areas that are 
blinking red, that's where you have the biggest impact with small changes. So what does it mean practically? Um, we know the situation, so how can we really start optimizing in a very personalized way? Because actually there's a million things we could do, right? Medications, we're going to get them off, but um, there's a lot of things we can do in terms of lifestyle, in terms of supplementation, in terms of training, which is very specific, but no one changes 50 things at the same time, right? No one changes all that at the same time. So we want to prioritize. We want to see where are the things where we're going to have the biggest impact. So based out of that, we created a very simple program for Bob to manage his inflammation, for example, making small changes in his diet, some lifestyle changes, caloric restriction, for example, a little plan around detox, what we can do, again, a little bit of diet, a little bit of lifestyle, on cholesterol, because these were the big three for him. There's other, th other things to fix, but those were the big three things. And now, what kind of impact did we see? And that's the amazing thing. So we changed the diet, massively, drastically re reduced the carbs, up with the good fats, right? Really added lots of fat into the diet. That was the first thing. So really changing the diet over, the, over those few weeks. The next thing, um, exercise. Initially, you know, Bob had joint issues, so we made some things to really fix, fix that. So he started running, got excited about running, moving for the first time, felt better, felt more energized, felt more energetic. And then, what was crazy, within a few weeks only, everything drastically changed. Inflammation, 10 times too high, went down to normal, CRP, so chronic inflammation, gone. Blood lipids, triglycerides, from um, I think three times too high, normalized within just a few weeks. Amazing results. Um, his, uh, what else do we have? We had his, yeah, metabolics, um, glucose, from being pre-diabetic, completely normalized within one or two weeks. Amazing. And again, we're not talking medications here. We want to get him off, and actually, we got him off most of the medications. And pretty much everything normalized, just through very personalized, very simple interventions in diet, in lifestyle, and in the way we look at health. So, essentially, someone who is very sick, who was probably really literally one or two years away from, from um, having a heart attack, having a stroke, something like that, normalized, and still today, a few years later, he's keeping his weight, everything is normalized, he's pretty much off all the medications, and he really is living a new life, and he has the chance to enjoy his life with his family in a healthy way. And that's really the power of data. That's really the power of data, because what we did was not rocket, rocket science. We just made sure we were very, very personalized. And now, um, initially I said that um, some of you are on the way of biohacking or optimizing yourself to death. And I meant it in a quite literal way, because what we also do with our team, we have a clinical team, we see a lot of people, we see a lot of health data, and our doctors see people that really mean well, they want to optimize their health, and they read all the stuff. Oh, I should take Enamen, oh, and amazing, and Metformin, and all these supplements. Rapamycin is a great thing, right? And, and so they start taking all the stuff, and I'm not saying that's bad, not at all. I'm taking most of these things myself. But what's important is you need to track it, because our doctors are seeing cases where people come in on 30 supplements, 40 supplements, and they're close, close to renal failure. So their kidneys are about to give up. And they're not doing anything bad. And if you want to optimize yourself, that's fine. Please do so. Please read. It's amazing. It's absolutely fantastic what we can do. But make sure to measure what you're doing. Make sure to, on a regular basis, make blood tests. Make sure to talk to professionals and to do it in a supervised way. Because even with simple things, you can screw up a lot in your body. And I don't want that to happen to any of you. Now, the final question is, is data the answer to anything, right? Is data the answer to everything that, that we have? Um, yes, well, <laughs> you might say that. I think to some extent it is, um, but there's also the opposite. You can look at data too much. And another example that I can give you for that is um, we have a case who is an active client of ours that we manage, that we coach with our clinical team. Um, very successful guy, billionaire, knows everything about health, he's actually a pharmacologist, 
knows anything about longevity, about self-optimization. And he came to us and he said, look, I, I, I know what I'm doing right or wrong, I'm eating well, all is good, but my biggest issue is I cannot sleep. I cannot sleep and I'm an executive, right? I need to function in the morning. I need to, be, I need to sit in meetings, I need to be sharp, I need to be clear in my head. And I'm sitting there, I'm foggy, I'm not sleeping, I'm waking up in the night, so everything is really, something is not right. And so we ask, okay, what are you tracking? Like, I'm tracking everything. I got the aura ring, I got the Garmin, I got the first beat, I got uh, the mattress that tracks my sleep. And every, every time I'm, I'm looking at all the data, I said, okay, great, let's have a look at that. So we looked at this data for a while, and then we started talking to him. And he said, oh, you know, last night, ah, I got 23 minutes of REM sleep uh, too short, and I should get more deep sleep and blah, blah, blah. And we realized he's actually obsessing so much with his data, with his sleep data, that he can't sleep. Like, he's, he's made this such an important part of his life to track his sleep data and to track everything that he's getting nervous about falling asleep. And when he wakes up, he's just checking the data again. And so we said, look, throw all the shit out and just go to bed, just sleep. And he was like, oh, I can't do that. Like, no, get rid of everything. Get rid of everything um, and let's, let's see how that works. And the surprising thing was, or not surprising thing was, um, within a few weeks, he's back to normal sleeping patterns. He's sleeping well, he's sleeping through the night. And no, he's fine now. So data isn't always the answer. That's what I'm trying to say. But data definitely can be a very important and critical factor in your health. And I know a lot of you use these devices. I know a, few, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of you are experimenting with supplements, with new molecules. Um, so use the data that you have. Um, use it carefully. Use it with professionals. Um, don't fall into the trap of taking everything at the same time. Look at what changes in your body when you start implementing either new interventions or taking new supplements or new drugs, whatever that it is, and really use the data to your benefit. Because data is not this bad thing, and especially health data, a lot of people are critical, but data is something that can support all of us in our health journey, and I think it's a really, really valuable tool.